It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Neda Makboulet, who's whose book, The Limits of Whiteness, Iranian Americans and the Everyday Politics of Race, has just really uh, catapulted in the world of books and ideas. And it is such an important work um, that many of us are, have been waiting for. Um, so she's really been doing phenomenal work, both in the field of sociology, but I think in a way she's really transformed how we talk about race in the Iranian context, um, particularly in North America. And she's also doing uh, more work with Syrian refugees in Toronto now. And um, I, I'm so excited to see what's next, Neda. Um, I'm purposefully keeping the bio short so you can read all about them in the uh, program. But I want to say that for me, it's such a privilege to see these younger scholars doing this phenomenal work that I think has really elevated all of us and all of our work, and you especially, Neda, I think, are doing something that is so important, is to have a conversation about race and about the ways in which we do and don't belong um, based on racial categories. So th thank you so much for your work, and well, please welcome Dr. Neda Makboulet. Dr. Karim, Ms. Neda Nobari, thank you for this extraordinary invitation. Uh, it's a convening that I honestly didn't think could ever happen because this takes resources, interest, imagination, and political commitment. Uh, it's really powerful uh, for me as a sociologist that we're having this conference and this Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies located at SF State where black studies, ethnic studies, and Chicano studies were birthed as fields of inquiry and modes of activist scholarship. Those who know my personal story or may have read my book know that I grew up in Portland, Oregon in the 80s and 90s. This era in Portland was not the Portlandia that we all know and recognize. No artisanal vegan donuts, no free trade locally made denim jeans. When I tell you that I grew up in the Portland of the 80s and 90s, think more like the townspeople in Netflix's Wild Wild Country documentary, accidentally wandering through an episode of Family Ties with those do-gooder white liberal parents and nuclear family that included that teenage Republican son. That was my social world growing up. <laughs> my mom and dad raised my little sister and me in Portland, away from extended family, but not away from other Iranians in Portland, teaching us a weird kind of ecumenical version of what family means. This had everything to do with my mom and dad being cast out of their biological families when they had fallen in love. This is because both of my parents are Iranian by nationality, but they come from religiously orthodox and observant families of origin, families who observe different traditions and religions and who didn't approve of my parents' relationship. Through the fortitude of their love for one another and their love for me and my sister, we were eventually welcomed back into the fold of biological family from our distant outpost in Portland. This complexity in my family's history and my parents' story has been described to me by others as epic, a love story for the ages, as emblematic. But back in Portland, as I journeyed further into adolescence, I didn't see myself as the inheritor of an epic generational love story of defiance, resilience, and badassery. In Portland, I saw myself as a squat, hairy, off-white Jesse Spano from Saved by the Bell <laughs> in a junior high that was sadly full of nerdy screeches with an occasional handsome Zach Morris that I might hopelessly pine after. At our school, we had plenty of hot Kelly Kapowskis, exactly zero Lisa Turtles or AC Slaters, and every authority figure felt to me like a hapless Principal Belding, or even worse, like an entitled, smug, grown-up version of Zach or Kelly. 
So what I'm trying to tell you is that Portland was and still is the whitest metropolitan area in the United States, and I watched a ton of TV as a child to cope. <laughs> oh, how I loved the three summers when I was 13, 15, and 16, and sent down to sulk and generally be a teenage asshole at my Ame Farida's house. Farida John, an Iranian Jew who lived in a gleaming tall apartment building on Wilshire Boulevard in Tehranjelis, took me shopping with her at Ilat Market, gave me a key to her place and let me wander around by myself at UCLA and wander into different branch locations of the Santa Monica Public Library. What a funny thrill to hear Persian spoken by strangers whose voices emanated out of bathroom stalls at the old Borders bookstore on Westwood Avenue. What a glimpse, what a future I could only marvel at when I spied on young Iranian women in push-up bras and velour sweatsuits hanging out on patios at shisha and hookah bars. All of these signs of ordinary life in Y2K Tehranjelis were completely extraordinary to me. Back at home in Portland with my tiny family and my tiny community that I didn't recognize at the time is especially interesting. I used crappy dial-up internet to literally ask Jeeves about Iranians in the US. Where did they live? How many of them are there? Jeeves couldn't find satisfying answers to either of those <laughs> questions. But some wonderful soul had hand-typed passages from Hamid Nafisi's 1993 book, The Making of Exile Cultures, to an AOL website, which I remember being the first academic writing that I sought out for myself, which made a positive impression on me. In the book, Dr. Nafisi analyzes nostalgia, loss, and identity through the lens of TV and music produced in Los Angeles on the possibility of emergent diasporic consciousness or some kind of diasporic relationship among Iranian Americans, Dr. Nafisi wrote back in 1993, quote, it is a relationship that is not so much based on shared originary facts, birth, nationality, color, race, gender, than on an adherence to a common imaginary construction. Discourse thus replaces biology. I definitely didn't understand Dr. Nafisi's formulation at the time, but something in that passage lit a fire of inquiry in me. As social isolates in Portland, were me and my family implicated in this common imaginary construction? And second generation youth like me, as we barreled toward adolescence and young adulthood, where did we fit in the space between biology and discourse? And that space between biology and discourse, was it a canyon for Iranians or was it a hairline crack? By the time I turned 18 and I left Portland to go to college somewhere, anywhere else, I realized that without good information, I'd been telling myself a binary story about Iranians that was based, one, on growing up in Portland, and two, visiting LA. Iranians to me at the time were either boring, social, isolate nobodies in far-flung minor locations like me, my parents, and my sister, or we were dynamic but also kind of toxic protagonists of a more complex and flashy story set in West LA. But when I turned 18 and I started to actually read interesting books, I realized that this binary story was exactly what it sounds like two and only two stories that are set apart in my mind at the time as false opposites. This false binary between Iranians being like this in one city and like this in this other city, uh, to me, those didn't explain broader things, the surveillance that was felt across all corridors. It didn't describe any particular relationship of Iranian Americans to the law to politics. It didn't yet seem to have any relationship to alternative dreams beyond what Nafisi had so beautifully written about exile. So as I began to read and write more as an earnest undergraduate, I felt more and more sure that a binary story about Iranian Americans as either one, delusional model minorities trying to pass as honorary whites, or two, 
Iranian Americans as just raging ethno chauvinists who stick to their own social bubble, that those binary formulations only work in conditions where communities of color are cast as nameless, faceless backgrounds, extras to the great Iranian American assimilation project, and that those binaries only work if we imagine future generations of Iranians in the US as assimilative know-nothings who wouldn't critically question what had been fed to them in American schools, full of lies, omissions, and white supremacy. I began to think that an easy story about Iranians in the US as just any other white immigrant group, like the Irish or the Italian, only works if you ignore abundant evidence to the contrary from foreign policy, from history, from the news, and from your own damn life. From where you all sit in the audience and from where I sat typing this out on my laptop, uh, it clearly doesn't require a psychoanalyst to look too deep into my personal history as an Iranian American and as a Portlander to see that studying white racism and how Iranians could be its target at the same time that Iranians could, would, and in fact have aided, abetted, and innovated on white racism that studying this would become the project and the impulse I couldn't shake for the next 20 years of my life. At 18, I knew I had to leave the easy story behind. At 22, 25, 28, I knew I had to collect many, many other stories, messy stories, not just Portland stories, but yes, okay, some old Portland stories that had been hidden from me. Not just LA stories, but okay, yes, also some more LA stories that were unlike the ones I'd previously known. I had to get to know teens and families in all four corners of the country and in the middle. I had to sleep on the floor in college students' dorm rooms in Maryland, sit beside them in mega-sized classrooms in New Jersey. I had to watch TV in living rooms with families in suburban communities like Braintree, Massachusetts, and spend evenings with youth around the campfire at a summer camp in the wooded hills of Northern California. I had to take stock of the photos, the ticket stubs, the doodles that decorated bedrooms around the South. I had to re-enroll in intro Persian alongside SWANA activists and ROTC soldiers at UC Santa Barbara. I had to hang out as youth joined in Asian American hip hop dance groups in rural Connecticut and suburban Atlanta and watch as they forged bonds with Arab, Black, and South Asian peers in Washington DC based Students for Justice in Palestine meetings. These young Iranian Americans were surviving and at times they even described to me that they felt like they were thriving. But they were also in pain, they were hurting, and they were in search for something greater than the sum of their parts. They were forging friendships with a far wider network of young people than had been previously theorized in social science that I dutifully read in college. They were starting to form intimate families and political community that reflected neither a story of social isolates nor just the story of an insular ethnic enclave, but also not an idealized version of assimilation into white Americana either. For 40 years and more, Iranian Americans have been doing the ordinary work of living while sociologists had either catastrophized their existence as tragic wannabe whites wearing blue colored contact lenses who are obsessed with status, wealth, or lost glory. Or more often, Iranians had been doing the ordinary work of living while sociologists had simply ignored Iranian Americans as unworthy of critical scholarly attention. Into my third decade of life, as I moved out of student mode and into professor mode, I saw two challenges ahead of me when it came to that book I so urgently wanted to write. One challenge you could call emotional professional, and the other one was emotional personal. The professional challenge was that the scholarly fields I had read and studied for, the sociology of race, ethnicity, and the sociology of immigration, were still extremely incontrovertibly tied to assimilation theory. These theories had, of course, been revised, updated, and improved upon since their original formulation 100 years ago. But they were still the standard frames, especially when it came to studying post-1965 immigrant origin groups like Iranians. And even in the most cutting edge literature uh, on assimilation, sociologists do this thing. And I think it's questionable at best. They take certain indicators of um, 
socioeconomic status, so something like a group's average educational attainment or their median income. And they use those outcomes as a proxy for more multiplex phenomena like a group's overall well-being and social inclusion. Never mind from a kind of methodological perspective that these homogenizing measures collapse the full range of conditions that are faced by any group, including Iranians and diaspora. Never mind what the texture of educational attainment as a process and not just an outcome might reveal about Iranian American well-being, or what the fine grade details behind that annual me median income, how that income is experienced or spent or shared by an Iranian American household, that those might reveal that these variables are actually not good proxies for well-being or belonging. My fear was would the Iranian case upset the assimilation apple cart? And let me be very honest, in this room full of friends and colleagues, that rather than fight a losing battle in sociology with my non-existent status in the field, my absolute lack of a fancy pedigree, I turned to the people in this room, both intellectually and I turned to you in real life, for ammunition and for strength. The artists, the poets, the scholars in the humanities, the anthropologists. I turn to the creative and the expansive thinkers in this room today who routinely imagined a transnational, anti colonial, and queer social world for Iranians and diaspora. They saw and described for me a world that I actually couldn't see for myself most of the time. They gave me a vision to hang on to beyond the narrow and provincial confines of US sociology. Greedy for frameworks that could account for ambiguity and complexity, I borrowed everything I could from ethnic studies, American studies, art history, literature, anthropology. I read literature that had absolutely nothing to do with Iranians, and I also read, with a face like the heart eyes emoji, the essays, articles, poems, art, fashion, and activism generated by the people in this room to be able to interpret the empirical data I'd collected, the archival documents, legal cases, interviews, and field observations, I needed art, history, and humanistic thought. Put another way, my professional fear was that sociologists would trash the book for being so greedy in the way it borrowed from the humanities, for how it resolutely tried to center racism as it was experienced by a technically white group. As I became more socialized in the logic of the capitalist academy, I also had an additional fear that at least getting trashed by the discipline might yield academic citation, which is the measure <laughs> through which universities and our departments define excellence. So was it worse to get trashed or ignored by senior people in the field and uncited or uninvited by scholars to come? You have to understand that in the sociology of race and ethnicity and immigration that defines my adult education since the 2000s, that an Iranian poet, critic, and scholar would be at the helm of an interdisciplinary international center for Iranian diaspora studies, this is simply not supposed to happen. In research on assimilation, stigma, stratification, and ethnicity, diaspora Iranians, according to the prognostications of sociologists, they would supposedly be trying to stay as far away from these kinds of 40th anniversary events as possible, not congregating at them. We weren't supposed to be here today speaking with complexity about the revolution. We're not supposed to organize in abolition and carceral justice movements. We're not supposed to sue the federal government with co-plaintiffs called Muslim advocates. And we're certainly not supposed to be proud of any of this. So my professional fear was either I had to be wrong about what my data was saying to me, or some of the most beloved, coveted theories in sociology were actually a form of academic gaslighting when held against the case of Iranians, who were, I may remind you again, supposedly boring and unworthy of study. And here was my personal fear. I am second generation, and the majority of testimonies featured in my book come from second generation Iranian Americans too. Because so many of the young people in the book were below the age of consent to participate in the study, I knew that those kids' as first generation parents had to be somewhat sympathetic to me and my study, because I needed to get parental consent. But how would first generation Iranian Americans who didn't know me from Hassan or Hussein feel about the collective work of all of us airing out some dirty laundry? 
What even would the nascent third generation, kids like my now five-year-old daughter Nilu, think about the book's digressions into unibrows, the Aryan myth, scientific racism, and the NCR's registry, and the ways that immigrant parents and kids fail one another? Again, those who know, know that the issues in my book, state-sponsored exclusion, street-level violence, policies that break families apart, they're more and more urgent right now. But in my personal fear about what generations before and generations to come would think about the book, in that fear, I underestimated both groups, I think. My strange little academic book has been given as a white elephant gift among Iranian-American relatives. Intergenerational book clubs have read it together over Skype. It's been reviewed in Persian by a first generation dad for a local Iranian newspaper in San Diego. And young people's grandparents joke with me in book signing lines that they may not agree with everything in my book, but that they love and are proud of me. Yes, a couple Iranian Americans have called into local radio shows I've been on and insisted to me on air that Irunia are genetically, biologically distinct from Group X or Group Y. But far, far more elders have said to me that now at age 65, 75, 85, and especially following the first executive order in January 2017, that they are more than ready to engage the question of race and racism. And their grandkids, that cohort of third, fourth generation Iranian Americans, some of them are in junior high and high school now. They're on Reddit and Wikipedia, and they're finding my book on Google Books, and they're emailing me to ask me questions for their class assignments. Iranian identity hasn't melted away for them, nor, and I find this so damn beautiful and defiant in our current climate, nor is being Iranian necessarily a source of pain, shame, or stigma, something to be avoided or muted, ignored in the hopes that no one will notice. It has been, and it continues to be life-affirming, it has been and continues to be life-giving. So before I finish, I want to tell you just one more story. I started by talking about growing up in Portland isolated with my parents and my sister. I told you about three solo trips I took to visit my Ame Farida, my dad's sister, in Tehran Jalas. Both of these parts of my past are true, but the whole story is incomplete, and I want to fill in that picture. The first story I told you about my mom, dad, sister, and I out in Portland, well, as you all know, these kinds of nuclear family formations are not the way people around the world actually live, but it's also not really how we lived either. You know how it is in Iran and in other societies where generations upon generations would live together in the same building, the same complex, the same compound. It's also a tiny bit like my childhood in Portland. My Khala Fati, my mom's sister, came to Portland from Tehran in 1986. You can see me snuggling up against her on the left. She came when I was five years old. And she lived with us for nearly 10 years until she moved into her, or her own home, seven minutes from my parents, which is still her home today. Fati Jun treated my sister and I like daughters, and she is my second mom. In preparation for this conference, someone asked me to reflect on how I was able to forge an Iranian identity or sustain a relationship to Iran from all the way out in Portland. And though there was a small community that we were active in, and my parents did a lot, it's really Fati who was my most direct connection to Iran. She taught me to read and write Persian with the children's textbooks that she brought with her in a suitcase. She created the art, she held the treasures. It's her Gorma Sabzi that I might actually love a little bit more than my own mom's. <laughs> it's a bitter pill to swallow that in today's America, there's no more Fatih getting on an airplane to come live with her sister and to watch her sister's kids grow up, graduate school, or get married. If I was that five-year-old in Portland now, I wouldn't know Fatih at all except through video and group chat. And maybe someday she and I would meet up in Iran or in Turkey or somewhere else. But she couldn't sit beside me in the room the first time I practiced writing Baba, Ab, Dad over and over and over. 
My relationship with Fatih and my relationship with Iran wouldn't have happened. It's prohibited, suspicious, banned. But all of us, we are in this room together today. I rejoice and give thanks for the opportunity to be here. I reject the conditions that have limited or stopped others from being here with us. I stand here with gratitude for how we've come together to fight, and I recommit to fighting harder and fighting more. Thanks. Thank you.